Some events are so newsworthy, so historic, that you have to stop everything to watch. To this day, despite its last episode airing years ago, The Office is still one of the most talked about, quoted, and most popular shows in the world. No joke, it's the number one most streamed show on all of Netflix. That's a crazy accomplishment considering the show no longer even exists. But with so many dedicated fans, you'd think that we'd know everything there is to know about the show. That might not be the case. In fact, there are a number of fan theories about The Office that are so wild, they just might actually be true. And if these things turn out accurate, then you may never look at the show the same way again. Here are 10 theories about The Office that just might change the way you look at it. That's what she said. Pam? For all intents and purposes, despite the show focusing on a lot of different people, Michael Scott is the main character. He also happens to be a complete buffoon. Seriously, it's comical, the degree of this guy's incompetence. Episode after episode, Michael is portrayed as a complete and utter loser. Only his track record says otherwise. If you really pay attention, Michael proves time and time again that his practices, although they might seem insane, are the best practices. When Michael and Jan take a client out to Chili's, he gets the job done. When Michael throws an ill-advised party in his hotel room rather than take meetings with clients at the paper convention, he ends up working out an exclusive deal with a huge supplier, even as branch manager. The Scranton branch of Dunder Mifflin that Michael oversees is constantly one of the company's top performers. Much to the confusion of his superiors, Michael somehow runs an extremely successful operation. He may be odd, and he may be inappropriate, but there's no denying that Michael Scott knows what he's doing. This one might be tricky to wrap your head around, but it would appear as though The Office, Parks and Recreation, and the show Dexter all take place in the same universe. It's sort of like their own little MCU. How does that make sense? Well, the through line is Saber. That's right, the company that buys up Dunder Mifflin in season six appears in both other shows. Parks and Recreation was actually originally intended to be a spinoff of The Office, but the concept was dropped. However, in season four and season five, you can see a Saber printer sitting on the desk in Parks and Rec. It's too bad these shows never cross paths. A meeting between Dwight Schrute and Ron Swanson would be incredible. So those two shows kind of make sense. They're similar styles and even have some backstory with one another. But how in the world does a show like Dexter fall into this? Well, yet again, a Saber printer is used in an episode. Michael's hatred for Toby is a long-running constant throughout the entirety of The Office. It's never really explained in detail why Michael feels so strongly about his head of human relations, but it's assumed it's because Toby stops him from having fun. After all, Michael enjoys being inappropriate, as well as overstepping the line when it comes to his involvement in his employees' lives. Toby's job is to stop Michael from any such behavior, so that could be the reason why Michael hates having Toby around. Toby is in HR, which technically means he works for corporate. So he's really not a part of our family. Also, he's divorced, so he's really not a part of his family. Or maybe there's a more personal reason. As the show progresses, we learn more and more about Michael's backstory. His parents got divorced and he had a stepdad named Jeff. There's clearly some resentment harbored inside Michael over this difficult time in his life. It's also well documented that Toby Flenderson is divorced himself. He even has a child with his ex-wife, whom I'm sure Michael can relate to. What if Michael's distaste for his head of HR has nothing to do with their working relationship, but everything to do with the fact that Toby represents something traumatic he went through as a child? That would explain why Michael is so inexplicably against everything Toby represents. Did Jim cheat in Philly? We know that the producers of the show have left things on the cutting room floor. For instance, they totally omitted the fact that Meredith obtained her PhD during the taping of the show. She casually mentions it during the panel on the final episode, but we didn't get to actually see it at all. There's no telling what sort of footage the film crew got that was cut from the final product. As the theory goes, Jim Halpert actually had an affair while staying in Philadelphia and working on Athlete. He and his wife Pam were going through a bit of a rough patch, to say the least, and he was living on his own in a different city. In fact, the majority of Jim's life in Philly isn't really shown in the show. There's even a part where Pam confides in Nelly, and she jokingly suggests that Jim is having an affair. Pam quickly dismisses it, and it's never brought up again. But then why leave that in the show? The whole thing is extremely suspicious. Look, the characters on the show are eccentric, to say the least. 
each character is more peculiar than the next. What started out as a relatively mundane, normal work environment in season one of the show really devolves into a wild cast of characters as the series progresses. That could be the result of the writing changing, or maybe it was intentionally part of the storyline. On several occasions, Toby Flenderson brings up that it's time to get the office tested for Radon. Unfortunately, it's Toby, and he's not really taken seriously in any situation, so they never do so. When there's a surplus in the budget, and the office is debating between new chairs and a new copier, Toby insists that they get the Radon tested. Alas, they never do. As the theory goes, Toby is right the whole time, and the office is slowly being polluted with Radon over several years. This would explain why everyone becomes more and more peculiar. It would even explain why Michael seems so normal in the final episode, after returning from Colorado. Ever wonder why the name Bob Vance is so synonymous with Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration? Well, it's because that's how he refers to himself throughout the entire series. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Ryan Howard. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Ever wonder why he refers to himself like that all the time? Well, because free advertising, Vance Refrigeration is the company that shares the second floor of the Scranton Business Park with Dunder Mifflin. It's owned by none other than Bob Vance, who ends up being Phyllis's husband. Being a business owner, Bob is constantly looking for every opportunity he can to promote his product. That's why he always refers to himself like that, and has everyone else do it too. There's a film crew walking around 24-7, capturing countless moments for an eventual spot on television. It's a prime opportunity to drill the name of your company into everyone's head. That's just smart marketing. Kevin is stealing money. It's the perfect crime. Nobody would ever expect it. Kevin Malone, the incompetent accountant who doesn't even know basic math, is actually a mastermind who's been embezzling money the entire time. I just want to lie on the beach and eat hot dogs. That's all I've ever wanted. The whole thing is a ruse. Kevin isn't stupid at all. In fact, he's playing everyone. There's a few examples throughout the series that hint at this being true. For starters, Kevin totally rips off Andy and Daryl when they're playing Dallas. He also admits to being a World Series of Poker finalist. Kevin also kind of snitches on himself when he admits to the camera crew, I had Martin explain to me three times what he got arrested for because it sounds an awful lot like what I do here every day. For those who don't remember, Martin is the Stanford employee who spent time in prison for insider trading. Kevin is also a major gambler, admitting to having a problem on several occasions. For crying out loud, he even won the trivia contest, beating Oscar's team at the gay bar. Above all else, don't you find it peculiar in the finale episode, Kevin no longer works at Dunder Mifflin and instead owns his own bar? Where'd he get the money to open up his own bar, huh? How does that add up financially? The whole thing is extremely shady. Phyllis and Stanley have been sitting across from one another for years. As a result, they've become pretty good friends, despite their contrasting attitudes. One fan theory suggests that they actually got romantic at some point before the series started. We know now that Stanley cheats, that's just in his nature. Phyllis can be quite a wild one as well. The real evidence, though, comes when Toby announces to the office that any interstaff relationships need to be disclosed to HR. Phyllis responds by asking if one night stands count. It was a funny bit at the time, but wait, what? Who in the office did Phyllis have a one night stand with? Our money is on the man sitting directly in front of her eyesight all these years. Toby is the Scranton Strangler. This is one of the most popular fan theories out there. The largest piece of evidence that would hint at Toby being the Scranton Strangler comes in the episode Viewing Party. The cold open to the episode features a scene where the employees of the office are watching the police chase the Scranton Strangler in his car. They're watching in the back room, where Toby typically sits, but he's nowhere to be found. In fact, they're watching the chase on Toby's computer. Later in the episode, when Gabe and Aaron host a glee party, Toby is suspiciously absent again. Despite the fact that the Scranton Strangler was found to be a man named George Howard Scubb, even Toby believes they got the verdict wrong. Toby is almost obsessive about the case, to a very strange degree. Numerous times he brings up the guilt of putting an innocent man in jail. It almost seems like a regular member of the jury wouldn't have that level of guilt, but the actual Scranton Strangler would. Creed Bratton is the walking enigma. The guy's entire existence is a crazy theory in itself. 
He's clearly the most unstable member of the Scranton crew, but some of his nonsense actually makes sense if you put the pieces together. For starters, it would appear as though Creed is on the hunt for the Loch Ness monster. He says as much during the episode, The Seminar, and also mentions his incessant need to scuba dive. That's because he's looking for a monster that doesn't exist. There's also the fact that Creed Bratton isn't even his name. One time he says, the last guy to steal from me was never seen again, and his name was Creed Bratton. On another occasion, he admits the Creed's debts get transferred over to a person named William Charles Schneider. The craziest thing about all of this? The actual actor's name who plays Creed Bratton is named Creed Bratton. Only that isn't his real name. His real name? William Charles Schneider. Do these possibilities change the way you see the show? Did your opinion of any of the characters change after hearing these theories? Let us know in the comments section below. Before you go, be sure to smash that thumbs up button. And if you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed to Screen Rant to stay up to date on all of our latest videos.